Good evening. I'd like to call our regular business meeting to order and ask the treasurer to call the roll. President Baker. Present. Mr. Brown. Here. Vice President Moore. Uh, present. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. And at this time, I would like to call Fort, High's, Fort Hayes High School Junior Jamie Booth to the podium to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone, please be upstanding. Welcome, Mr. Booth. You, thank you very much, Ms. Booth. We appreciate that. Um, thank you all for being here this evening, and um, we'll get moving right away. So let me read through our agenda briefly so we all know the business we have before us this evening. Uh, after we adopt the agenda, we will have a Black History Month recognition, um, after which we will hear from individuals who have signed up to provide public comment to the board. We will then take up um, after hearing our uh, direct report reports, we will then take up our consent agenda, after which we will um, take announcements, um, hear from our city director of education, um, and then the board will recess into executive session. So having said that, the chair will now entertain a motion that we adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Mr. Treasurer? President Baker? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yeah. Vice President Cole. Yes. Ms. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Peretti? Yes. Ms. Reyes? Yes. That motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. And now I'd like to turn to Board Member Gibbs to lead us in a Black History Month recognition. Board Member Gibbs? Yes. Thank you, President Baker and um, President Baker, Vice President Cole, members on the board, and all of these gathered. We'd like to take a moment now to recognize Black History Month. This all began in 1926 with the Association for the Study of Negro Life and Negro History, known today as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and from the minds of noted scholar, historian, and father of black history, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He graduated from the University of Chicago in 1907 and received his PhD from Harvard University in 1912. He dedicated his life to studying the achievements, the history of African Americans in America. And since 1976, every US president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. So we take time to honor the contributions of Afri African Americans in our country from the beginning, all of their inventions and their continual enrichment of our society, culture, and diversity. And we commit to reaching for a new day when no person is judged by anything but the content of their character. So as we take this time to recognize Black History Month, we pause to reflect on our progress in our history, not only to remember, but to also acknowledge our unfinished work. And here to bring words of inspiration about our amazing history is Afrocentric early college junior, Mr. Yandris Ferguson. Here, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Good evening, President of the Board, Superintendent Stafford, and the members of the Board of Education and members of our community. Hopefully by now, you have all flipped your calendars in your respective homes and have begun the month of February. And if you haven't flipped your calendar yet, I would highly recommend doing so later this evening. <laughs> to many, February has no special significance. It is just another month out of the year. But to African Americans and others, the month of February is held in high regard, as February is, of course, Black History Month.
For 28 days out of the year, and 29 every leap year, black people reflect on their history, and they honor and revere the accomplishments of black people, not only in this country, but also in Canada and Germany. Accomplishments of blacks are also observed in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands annually in October. This time-honored tradition was begun by historian Carter G. Woodson with the vision in mind to honor the astounding but hastily overlooked contributions of blacks in America. The first such celebration, known as Negro History Week, began in 1926, during the second week of February. This week was intentionally chosen to coincide with the birthdays of the Emancipator-in-Chief, President Abraham Lincoln, and abolitionist and orator, Frederick Douglass. Both of these luminaries were, and still are, held with high esteem to blacks in America. Woodson also created the occasion to educate the nation's black youth about accomplishments of their people and their ancestors. Woodson's belief was that we all come from greatness, and this rings true to this day. The first celebrations of Black History Month occurred in February of 1970 here in Ohio at Kent State University. Soon, educational institutions, centers of black culture, and community centers around the country followed suit, and in 1976, the year of our nation's bicentennial, then-President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month as a national celebration. However, over the course of time, we have failed our nation's children, specifically our nation's African-American children, about teaching them about their history. We have, rather subconsciously or otherwise, let black history slip out of the curriculum of many of our schools, and in particular, our urban schools. If you ask students in high school and on the collegiate level to name a few historical black figures, mostly you will see the ubiquitous names, such as Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks. Black history is not just limited to these aforementioned names. While King, X, and Parks represent a very vital part of our history, they do not make up the entire history. And in 2018, if you ask our youth to name historical black figures, they may surpass the names I've just mentioned for hip-hop artists and basketball players like Jay-Z, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, etc. There is a cultural chasm inside many of our supposed temples of learning that ignores the contributions of black Americans and fails to educate the next generation about the struggles, contributions, and triumphs of the architects of America. It bewilders me that so many urban schools or schools that are directed towards African-American students simply miss the mark when teaching kids about their history. Professor Wilson said it himself, if a race has no history or worthwhile tradition, it stands in danger of being exterminated. There are so many prominent and pertinent figures of black history that many of our schools simply just do not cover. For instance, Many black children do not know that it was Garrett Morgan, a black man, that invented the traffic light and the gas mask. Or that it was a black man, Dr. Daniel Hare Williams, that performed the first successful open heart surgery in this country. Or that it was a black woman, Sarah Boone, that invented the ironing board. Just think, millions of kids, and people in general for that matter, wouldn't do not realize that had it not been for the invention of a black woman, we would not have the means to press our beautiful polyester shirts that fill our closets. <laughs> Just today in my class, only a quarter of the students in the class could attest to knowing about the founder of the Pan-African movement, Marcus Garvey. And even a smaller handful were acquainted with the life and significance of activist Medgar Evers or his brutal slaying in the summer of 1963. And not only do so many blacks not know about education of prominent figures, they do not know about their own ancestry. I take it upon myself to know about my ancestry and the black history that goes along with it. My grandfather, Lemuel Ferguson, was one of the first black firefighters to serve with the Columbus Fire Department. And my aunt, Miss Narina Clark, when she joined the fire department in 1983 with my grandfather, became the first father and daughter team 
to serve together on any fire department in any major city in this country. My grandfather served 34 and a half years with the Columbus Division of Fire before retiring in 1995 and made it his business for the last 16 years as the Equal Employment Liaison. He alone, well not alone, he and the partner were responsible for a 750 percent increase in African Americans to take the civil service test to get to the Columbus Division of Fire during the 1970s and paid out of his own pocket for blacks to take the test, contributing up to $5,000 for blacks to make it to the Division of Fire. Education is the most, thank you, education is the most powerful tool a person could ever have in their repertoire. For centuries, blacks were denied the privilege of reading or writing, things that we take for granted today, and were beaten, ruth and were beaten ruthlessly and executed for attempting to learn such things. Little Rock, Little Rock Nine, back in the 50s, were shouted so many horrible expletives by white students who couldn't accept that black children need an education too. So many blacks fought, bled, and died for the ability for millions of children to obtain a free and equal education. My grandmother, who marched on Washington in 1963, went to jail for this right. And for us to take this privilege for granted is a slap in the face to ourselves. And for educators to not teach about this history, or for us as children to be unreceptive to this history, is an insult to the men and women who died premature, unnecessary deaths and are now lying in hollowed out graves in the upper room. As Dr. King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Even 50 years later, Dr. King's quote should resonate with all of us. Though physically we may have been freed, it's the freedom from fear that is the need of the hour. And to free our mind from this fear, we need to educate our youth and ourselves about the rich history of all of our ancestors. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, um, yes, I thank you very much for being here and sharing those inspirational words. And I do want to recognize and maybe ask to come to the podium briefly uh, Principal Walker from Columbus Afrocentric. And Ms. Gibbs, did you have some additional comments? At this yes. I, as Dr. Walker comes or stands to be recognized, either I do want to point out Columbus Afrocentric early high school is one of our premier citywide lottery programs. It's a choice program that all students in the city of Columbus can lottery in to attend with a focus on both early college admission and African and African American history. We appreciate your leadership, Mr. Ferguson. I am renewed in the next generation of leadership and, and to um, just thank you for your words and to remind Everyone, black history is American history. It belongs to all of us, and we take your words to heart. Dr. Walker, would you like to say a few words? Good evening, uh, Board President Baker, Vice President Cole, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Stanford. Good job, Yandris. Do you mind, Mr. Ferguson, taking a quick picture with board members? Uh, and Dr. Walker, please come right up here to the front of the table.
Um, thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Any other of my colleagues have any comments they'd like to make regarding our recognition of African American History Month? All right, we will have another opportunity to recognize uh, this month at our next meeting. So look forward to that. And the speaker at that meeting has a lot to live up to now. So thank you for being here. All right, let's move on then to the public comment portion of our meeting. And we do have, um, and I should say, Mr. Ferguson and Dr. Walker, if you need to leave to be somewhere else, feel free to do that. We won't be upset. Thank you, have a good night. So we do have um, six individuals who have signed up to provide public testimony to the board this evening. And so we're going to do that next. Uh, we do limit speakers to four minutes each, and so you'll see on the screen a timer, and as you near your four minutes, please begin to wrap up. We appreciate you taking the time to be here to speak on these important issues. So I'll call your name, and I'll give the topic and board action requested, and I'll just ask you to come to the podium, and your four minutes will begin when you begin speaking. First speaker, uh, Kathleen Felix, topic, financial cap, Board action, take a close look at the proposed budget. Coach, hi, how are you? Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, uh, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer, Treasurer Bahoric, Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board, Interim Superintendent Dr. Stanford. Uh, my name is Felix Cataline. Uh, I come here today not only as a proud teacher and coach in Columbus City Schools, but as a taxpayer and active member in Westgate. The message I bring to you is a reflection of the attitudes of many of the professional colleagues throughout CCS as well as many of my neighbors in the Hilltop community. I agree with all of you that one of the main issues with our current financial crisis is the lack of equity in state funding and an agenda against public education. However, I want to bring to the fore a third issue, the spending habits of Columbus City Schools. This has been highlighted on this board when a discussion was brought up about expenses for professional development for Board of Education members. I would like to take this time to applaud the leadership of Mr. Eric Brown for speaking out against the spending and for the bravery of Mr. Dominic Peretti for supporting Mr. Brown's motion to put a moratorium on such spending until we have navigated through this financial crisis. As I listened to our treasurer share last week the criteria for which budget items were up for reduction or cuts, I was disheartened when something as non-essential as Board of Education PD and travel expense is not something that could be going to the wayside immediately. I'm not arguing against any professional development as having merit. I'm arguing that in times such as these, all non-essentials need to be considered for cuts. Some of you may see this spending as justifiable given its scale and that they are just a few drops in the bucket. I'm here to tell you that my 11 year career in this wonderful school district that those drops are not few and they are creating buckets and those buckets are in turn creating swimming pools of non-essential spending of the taxpayers' dollars. Yes, the state funding method is crippling us, but that is all the more reason for us to be financially responsible. To those of you who may disagree with my message, please hear my concern as it reflects a large majority opinion of educators and community members alike. To those of you who see my point and are putting action to your words, like Mr. Brown and Mr. Peretti, I applaud you. And on behalf of the Hilltop, we support you. Thanks for your time. Which one? Thank you, Coach. Thanks for being here. Are there any clarifying questions from board members for Coach Cataline? All right, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time to be here, Coach. All right, let's move on then to let's move on then to Stephen Hardwick. Topic: How to handle the budget cuts. Board action. Look at Board Member Peretti's idea of consolidating schools to save money. Mr. Hardwick, good evening. Thank you. Good evening, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer Bahorek. Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent Dr. Stanford. Uh, this board should look for ways to avoid a thousand little cuts and quite a few um, medium and big size cuts by looking for large savings by consolidating schools. Um, I know we're probably going to hear a bunch of other people come up here and talk about very useful programs at their schools that are on the on the uh, that are on the cutting board. And part of them here is I was a member of the, master the facilities master plan ad hoc committee. And one thing I learned there is that we have a lot of, a lot of under capacity buildings, buildings where maybe they're half or two thirds full. And it doesn't make sense 
to do lots of little cuts when you have that overcapacity. The other thing I learned from them from that is that when you combine schools, you actually make education better. And a lot of people don't like the idea of combining schools. They don't like the idea of, big, of bigger schools, but they actually get better programs. You can, instead of just having an art program, you get a general art class, you can have a pottery class. Instead of having no languages, you can have Spanish. Instead of having Spanish, you can have Spanish and French. Um, I'd also like to just mention a few of the proposed cuts, and I'm told I can mention the names of programs, but not schools. And we're just at the Gifted Academy, we're just learning, we're just trying to figure out now what that cut, what the cut to the, um, to the partnerships would mean. Those, the partnerships with COSI and the Art Museum are the heart of the school's middle school program. Um, given the other cuts, I can't come here today and say, don't cut that and cut this instead because I don't know what, what else is there and we're still trying to process it. But you would be cutting something at the heart of the school. But a couple of the other cuts are troublesome because they don't, they won't affect my kids in any way. And I have two kids in the Columbus City Schools. Um, cutting the field trips won't hurt them, money for field trips, that million dollar care, won't hurt them at all. Why? Because we have a PTA and PTO who will just cut the check to pay for it. Chromebooks, you're cutting out new Chromebooks. We bought an entire cart of Chromebooks for one of my kids' schools last year. Our ki the kids at the middle class schools are not gonna suffer when you do this. It's only, your those cuts are directed at the poorer parts of town only, and that just doesn't seem right. So again, I would just like to come back and ask this um, board to carefully look at um, board member Peretti's ideas about consolidating schools, look for ways to save money while actually making education better for the kids of this school district. Thank you very much. And unless there are any questions, I will thank, just thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hardwick. Are there any clarifying questions from board members for Mr. Hardwick? Mr. Preddy? I just want to thank you for you know the time that you put in with Ms. Gibbs and myself as we went through that process. It was a, a very big undertaking, and it really uh, gave us a blueprint to how to look at the future of our buildings. And we put a lot of time in, Board Member Gibbs and myself. And this district, before I even got on the board, has done this before. This isn't anything new. The se more senior members of the board have, have done this year after year after year before uh, I actually got on the board. Uh, when it came to consolidation, right size in the district. You know, a lot of people don't like that word, but it's exactly what it is. Um, but I just want to thank you, and I want to you know, thank our, our senior board members who have, have done this. I came on right when we did Brookhaven. Remember Mr. Cole and myself, it was the first thing that we did, <laughs> talk about uh, you know, eyes wide open. Um, but you know, thank you, thank you to my board, and uh, I hope that we can find a pathway forward and explore this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peretti. Any other clarifying questions for Mr. Hardwick? Thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Peretti, thank you for acknowledging the work, prior work of the board. We've, this district has closed, I do believe, 38 buildings during the past decade. And so it's incredibly important that we remain vigilant in our stewardship of, of public tax funds. And that's an area that we need to continue to observe. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Gibbs. I'll save it for budget. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, next speaker, Karen Staley. Topic, budget cuts, board action, consider suggestions. Ms. Staley, good evening. Good evening, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer Bohorek, uh, Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent, Dr. Stam Sam sorry, Stanford. <laughs> A little nervous. Um, um, as um, I'm a resident of Columbus, I've been a resident of Columbus since 1995 and a supporter of Columbus City Schools that entire time, and I have two children in the schools right now. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that I'm aware of the difficult decisions that the district and the board are facing as a result of the state funding cuts seven, from 7% down to 3% or 4% rather. Uh, I am deeply concerned with the possibility of cuts to our teaching staff, our curriculum, and to programming currently available to assist students in achieving their college and career goals. As you move forward and make decisions on the recommended budget cuts, Sorry, I lost my spot. <laughs> um, it is my hope that you will continue to look at alternatives, including building consolidation, potential cost savings days, similar to what the state of Ohio implemented about 10 years ago, and other holistic approaches to cost reductions. 
While it is my understanding that no decisions have been finalized on cuts to our teaching staff, I want to take the opportunity to urge the board to request details from CCS administration regarding all proposed teacher and curriculum cuts to our schools on a building by building basis. All other pro proposed cuts are being reviewed line by line, and it is important we give the same, if not a greater level of scrutiny to the proposed cuts to our teaching staff. As much as it would be easy to put all of our schools in a box, each has unique needs that, need, that ought to be considered with respect to the programs and curriculum available. I am sure you are all aware, oftentimes just looking at the numbers does not give you a full picture of the potential impact on individual schools, programs, and most importantly, our students. At the high school level in particular, reductions to teaching staff may impede a student's ability to complete coursework, sign up for a particular class, or receive the diploma that they are pursuing. All of these factors should be part of the decision-making process. In addition, it is my understanding that cuts to specific teaching staff will be reviewed in the spring um, in the normal manner that they always are. Um, the timing of teaching staff decisions will have a far greater impact on our high school students who will soon be choosing their courses for next year. Please take this into consideration as you move forward with this process. On a final note, I would like to express concern that the International Baccalaureate Program is on the list of considered cuts, not recommended, but considered at this time. As a parent and part of the Columbus City Schools community, I want to see that all of our schools are, succeed, and I especially want to ensure that the programs available, such as the International Baccalaureate Program, the Latin Program, and internship programs, continue at all of our successful schools and our nationally ranked schools. Thank you for your hard work and your dedication to Columbus City Schools. Thank you, Ms. Staley. Any clarifying questions for Ms. Staley? Thank you very much for being here. We Thank appreciate you. it. Our next speaker is Sunny Kalina. Topics, budget cuts, board action, keep the Latin teacher and the IB program at cause. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer Bahorek, the Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent Dr. Stanford. Um, I would like for the board to keep Latin and the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, there is currently only one school in the district that offers both Latin and IB. It attracts your highest performing students, and we need to retain them. The scholars enrolled in Latin and IB are already on the pathway to meet their college goals. Keeping Latin and International Baccalaureate meets the district's goal of allowing students to meet their full potential. These students plan to pursue careers in law, medicine, science, linguistics, classics. Two of the students, one is uh, currently enrolled, is planning to be a molecular geneticist. Another student is on the pathway to be a di um, diplomat at the United Nations. Cutting teachers at high schools after students are already enrolled disrupts the college pathway that they're on. The students need the stability of knowing that once they're enrolled in high school, the programs they're counting on to achieve their bright futures will remain in place. The work shows up on their college transcripts. It disrupts their ability to plan for a stable college pathway if their high school teachers are cut once they're already enrolled in high school. As parents, we've been very flexible um, throughout the K-8 levels um, as, as things change from year to year or every other year um, because it doesn't impact their lifelong goals in quite the same way as it does uh, once the work is appearing on their college transcript. If you have to cut high school teachers, I urge you, please don't do it before the class of 2021 graduates. Instead, consider some kind of stair-step program where you phase things out as opposed to disrupting a diploma pathway or a collegiate pathway once a student is already enrolled. If Latin is cut, the currently enrolled high school students cannot even enroll in the International Baccalaureate program because they won't meet the language requirements to enroll. They will not be able to complete their IB diplomas that they've spent years working towards or achieve their honors diplomas. We need Latin and the International Baccalaureate program to not only attract the highest performing students to the district, but to retain them. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Kalina. Are there any clarifying questions? Mr. Peretti? Yes. Has there been any uh, outreach to the, the PTA um, from the district on the Latin program? It, do you mean the, has, the has the district contacted the PTA? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware of, sir. It was my understanding that there was going to be uh, some information from the administration that would be going to cause, uh, and they were going to discuss uh, Latin and you know what situation we're in. And again, these are just recommendations, but it was my understanding um, that there was going to be some sort of communication. Thank you, President Baker, members of the board, board member Peretti. That meeting is scheduled for February the 8th with the FOCAS group, which is CAUSE's PTA. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Kalina? Thank you very much Thank for taking the time to be here this evening. Our next speaker is Jason Davis, Topic Budget, Board Action, uh, Latin, IB. Mr. Davis, are you with us? Good evening. Good evening, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer Bohor, Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent Dr. Stanford. <clears throat> uh, I would like the board to keep the Latin and the International Baccalaureate program through the 2021 school year so all currently enrolled students can complete the college pathway that they're on and earn their IB honors diplomas. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis. Any clarifying questions for Mr. Davis? That was very plainly put. Thank you very much for being here this evening. We appreciate your time. All right. We have one more uh, speaker, Frederick Garrett. Topic, mistreatment of black children in the education system. Board action, stop the mistreatment of black children. Mr. Garrett, good evening, welcome back. Good evening, President Baker, Vice President Cole, Treasurer Bohoric, Internal Auditor Smith, members of the board and interim superintendent, Dr. Stanford. The topic I'm speaking on is the mistreatment of black children in the education system. Since this is Black History Month, I thought I would share a little black history of education since history seems to repeat itself. On June 11, 1963, the most powerful man in Alabama stood at the door of a building at the University of Alabama and refused to allow the first two black students to enter. His name was Governor George Wallace. I remember seeing Mr. Wallace on TV during that time. I was an eight-year-old boy. On that day, I decided that I was going to go to college just to show that evil man that he could not stop me. The problem of not wanting blacks to be educated didn't start in 1963. Way back in 1871, a 35-year-old black woman named Carolyn Smith testified before Congress about what happened to her in Atlanta, Georgia. Mrs. Smith and her husband were reading some books and trying to become educated when some white men from the Ku Klux Klan came into their home. The men beat her and her husband. Then the men took all of their books and threw the books into the fire. Then the men said, we dare any other N-word to have a book in this house. If you read the early history of Mrs. Rosa Parks, she also speaks of having to take her books out of the little country schools to prevent the Klan from taking the books and burning them. But what does all of this have to do with education today? Well, in this Columbus School District, we have a practice of not allowing children to bring home books and we are doing this in the schools where the black children go. In Clinville, they get to bring home books. If George Wallace were alive today, he would love this Columbus school system, and he would love how it treats black children. I have a recommendation for the black people in the room, including those on the board and those in the administration. My recommendation is that you do a, that you do a double amount of studying black history this month. I'm sure you all are well qualified for the positions you hold, 
However, you should understand that you did not get those positions on your qualifications alone. There were people back in history, black people and even some white people, who took a risk of being beaten or even lynched to pave the way for you. So I'm hoping you can make a sacrifice or two to see to it that some of these mistreated and undereducated black children can get school books to bring home. Then maybe they can begin to receive some of the education that children of other races are getting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Are there any clarifying questions from board members? Okay. Thank you for being here this evening, Mr. Garrett. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Gibbs. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who came out to um, give us your words about the budget. We really enjoy hearing from the community. Um, we're very sensitive to our entire district, and we don't represent wards. We don't have a ward system or districts. We're here so that each student is highly educated, prepared for leadership and service, and empowered for as citizens in a global community and that um, this budget is one that's prepared with thousands of hours of consideration and turmoil and it's a it's a job to balance the budget and not pit people against each other. We live in an open enrollment district, so no matter what building you are in, there could be a child from any side of town. It doesn't matter where the building sits. Every single school in our district has a student from across town, from the other side of the tracks. So it doesn't matter where we make a cut. All of our students are going to take a sacrifice. Everyone is going to take a sacrifice. But our job is to keep us as whole as possible, to provide the services to all of our students, and to make sure um, we maintain a pathway for our students to be highly successful and prepared for graduation and that our staff are equipped with the tools that they need. If George Wallace was here, he'd have to look at me sitting on this side of the table as a black woman. So I wish he was here. Please believe it. So just know we believe in each and every one of our students. Just know we understand our history. Just know that we advocate for everyone and we want all of our programs to be successful. It is very difficult, but if you want to know my decision process, I wake up every day, all 12 years, saying, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's what we're bringing to this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. All right, so I do want to thank everyone who did come to speak tonight. Uh, we're going to finish up hearing from the administration on the recommended budget reductions this evening. Most of you probably know we had a meeting last Tuesday and went through most of the reductions. We're going to hear the last few tonight, and then the administration is going to outline recommended public engagement opportunities. So we will have three or four additional nights in February when people can come and speak specifically to the budget reduction. So there will be additional opportunity and I ask you to take advantage of those opportunities to make sure that your voices are heard during this process. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments? If not, Mr. Brown? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to acknowledge um, that we have many students here this evening, uh, who are part of the Franklin County Youth Council. Uh, very important uh, and good uh, youth leadership program in our community. Um, it's it's uh, throughout the county, and uh, they're here in part because they're uh, learning uh, by attending a school board meeting. Uh, I guess each of them are supposed to uh, attend uh, two school board meetings uh, during their time. And uh, I don't know if any, uh, you know, thank you all for being here. And, and I don't know if any one of you uh, wants to say something for a moment to uh, let us know what the program's all about. Thank you, Mr. Brown. If, if all those students could stand up and be recognized and appoint someone to come forward and speak. Hello, my name is Jamie Booth. I'm a junior at Fort Hayes High School. 
I'm Ariana Wilson. I'm a junior at New Albany High School. And we are part of the Franklin County Youth Council. The Franklin County Youth Council was funded by a um, by a part of Obama when he, in 2010, he wanted to have a community conversation talking about, after the Sandy Hook project, about what else we can do for our community to help us bring us together more. And out of as a result of that conversation, we have figured out that we need to um, find more ways to um, to complete more high school students and more students as involved inside of the community and in the council, which made the Franklin County Youth Council. And also with the Franklin County Youth Council, we bring a group of Franklin County teens across Franklin County, and we all get together and just discuss what's going on in our communities and how we can improve it. And also, like this year, we have different committees, and we're talking about youth opportunities, um, mentors especially, and also mental health, and um, intersexuality, uh, many other different campaigns, just to bring awareness to what's going on with their youth in our community, and what we can do to help change our community. Thank you for, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Brown, appreciate that. And thank you students for being here and thank you for your leadership. Keep up the good work and we'll look forward to you doing great things in the future. And if you do need to leave, if you need to go home and do homework or something, we'll totally understand. But feel free to stay. I, I know you need to stay for meetings. All right, very good. Let's then, if there are no other comments related to that, let's move on to item 5.1. And uh, Mr. Vice President, are you prepared to read a notice of public hearing? Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. President. Uh, for notice of public hearing on the reemployment of Betty Array, uh, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 3309.345, the Columbus Board of Education gives notice to Betty Array, payroll supervisor, who will retire from the Columbus City Schools effective April 30th, 2018, is seeking employment with the Columbus City Schools as payroll supervisor effective May 2nd, 2018. The board will hold a public meeting on April 4th, 2018 at 5.30 p.m. in the assembly room of the Columbus Education Center, 270 East State Street, Columbus, Ohio, on the issue of Ms. Array's reemployment. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. All right, now we will move on to our direct report reports, and I'll call on our interim superintendent, Dr. John Stanford. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, and, you know, the, the budget is a very important topic uh, for us every year. Uh, it uh, outlines the resources that we are utilizing to educate our, our, our students. And um, I, I'm really just humbled uh, by the display of our students here this evening. Uh, from Mr. Ferguson and the very powerful powerful speech that he gave uh, to the young people who are here from the Franklin County Youth Council for them to just spontaneously come up uh, and share with us the work that they are doing and how they started. It's just a demonstration of how the resources that we have as a district go to educate our students and to build our community and make our community better. So uh, with that, uh, at our last meeting uh, last Tuesday, uh, we stopped on page 13, I believe, and I just wanted to uh, uh, go back to page 13 just to make sure there weren't any uh, remaining questions from that page. Okay. All right, let's go on to page 14. And, and for the listening audience and for those in the room, um, what, we are, what we have done is we have uh, put together a document uh, for the board's review, and it, it is available on our web page. Uh, with the uh, agenda from last week's meeting. Um, and we've gone through each section of this document, this spreadsheet, and we've allowed the board members to ask us questions on each page of that spreadsheet. And so we're gonna continue that conversation uh, this evening because we did not get a chance to finish the last four pages of the document. Uh, and so with that, the uh, next page of the uh, document is the eighth office um, of the document, which is the Internal Audit Office, represented by Internal Auditor uh, Carolyn Smith. Uh, both budget items that are listed under uh, the Internal Audit are operational supports, 
and I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Smith uh, to uh, add any additional uh, remarks that she may want to add at this time. Thank you, Dr. Stanford. Uh, President Baker, Vice President Cole, members of the board. Uh, we do have a question, uh, another question on page 13. I do apologize for interrupting you, Mr. Superintendent, if you don't mind. Uh, Mr. Peretti and then Mr. Brown. Thank you, uh, President Baker. Um, I do have a, a question about page 13, and I, and I, and I know we, we moved through this, but I do have another question about a previous page as well. Maybe when we finish up, I, we could revisit that. But, but, I, but to go to page 13, which we're still on, Ms. Gibbs, thank you. Um, I would just like, I know we have been talking a lot about, uh, you know, what possibly uh, the board can consider moving into the future when it comes to consolidation. Um, I would like briefly if we could sort of describe sort of the process for that, what the administration sees, um, you know, how we could as a board uh, look at some recommendations so that we can have the right information, so we can have, you know, a snapshot of what's going on maybe in, in some of these buildings that uh, quite frankly are, you know, underpopulated, falling apart, you know, many different reasons what triggers this. but. You know, I'd like to understand a little bit more clearly what we could expect, and that way we could talk to the community about this possible uh, pathway, with, with especially high school consolidation. Uh, President Baker, uh, Mr. Peretti, um, one of the uh, first steps uh, that the administration uh, will recommend uh, to the Board of Education is that um, the board uh, develop a resolution that provides uh, guidance to the administration in terms of the scope of this review of the facilities uh, portfolio for the district uh, and hopefully also within that resolution outline uh, the, uh, the different um, aspects of our portfolio that we should look at. Um, and hopefully we would be able to develop uh, and create that resolution in the very near future uh, the board hopefully would adopt that resolution at the next board meeting, um, and then, uh, you know, as a uh, in in leading up to that that next board meeting, the administration would uh, put together uh, a process uh, for reviewing the entire portfolio of, of facilities that we have. Um, the The recommendation would be that uh, we would uh, have some type of committee made up of internal and external stakeholders. Uh, that would uh, uh, be similar to what is outlined in board policy 7105, which is the policy on school closings. Thank you. Thank you, Interim Superintendent. And um, I do believe that Ms. Gibbs perhaps had a follow-up question on that particular item. So would the information already provided in the facilities master plan not be enough to begin the analysis of the school closures it's completed it is what the board has already approved and adopted with the outline which includes closures and consolidations so could that body of work suffice in terms of the beginning of the review it, it, uh, mr president uh, ms gibbs the the fmp process i'm mean, sorry the fmp um that was revised a couple of years ago would definitely be a part of the considerations uh, of that process, uh, but the the um, policy seven board policy 7105 is driven more uh, by the uh, enrollment of the buildings as they currently stand, and so the, the the main driving force would be a review of the enrollment of all of our buildings uh, within our portfolio, and then look at the other factors that are outlined in the board policy in addition to those enrollment uh, figures. So you're offering to open that resolution and begin that task force based on enrollment rather than facility condition? Yes, ma'am. But also, again, uh, one of those factors that as a part of board policy 7105 is also the condition of the facilities as well. I'm very familiar with the school closing task force, and there's normally seven points in, upon which we review. And so, board member Peretti, are you offering that we begin that process of school closures in the context of the budget conversation? I, mean, I think it's an opportunity that we have to take not only for the budget, but at the same time, mm -hmm. the, the plan that you and I had uh, chaired, um, there are a lot of things that we can do and there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, as we prepare, you know, the district for the future, we, you know, it's not okay that some buildings, you know, aren't equitably 
physically sound. Um, so not only for enrollment issues, but also the condition of the buildings. When we do, we are, I mean, districts go back to the levy at some point, and when we're going to ask for academic dollars, I want to keep, and so would this board, any sort of millage low. Uh, and then when it comes to facilities, yes, there is some fat to cut. And it would show us that we're doing our job and our due diligence to put the district in the right position moving into the future. That way we could build beautiful anchor institutions, renovate buildings, get these buildings in the shape that all these kids deserve. Uh, but we do have some fat that needs to be cut when it comes to our buildings. It's not okay that some buildings are you know, not in a great shape compared to other buildings. And some parts of the, the master facility plan can be acted upon without additional dollars. So this isn't us, you know, building new right now, but it's positioning ourselves for that when we finally do get to that point, and then we can execute that plan that you and I and that 50-person committee <laughs> put together. You know, we can act upon that eventually, but there are some things we have to do, and, and when we're talking about the budget, yes, this is a good opportunity for us right now because there isn't a single person here in this room that sees any of these budget reductions as anything anyone wants to do. So as a board member, I'm going to do my due diligence, and we all do. And like I said, this is a board, members before me and the administration, that have done this time and time again. And uh, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, it's also positioning ourselves for the adequate growth of the district for the future. So it's, yes, it's painful. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to put ourselves in a great position for the future to grow properly and to get all of our kids in sound uh, 21st century buildings that are flexible and that are equitable across the whole district. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baker. <clears throat> uh, I agree with what's been said, and, and I agree with the direction that we're now headed to take a close look at uh, consolidation and right-sizing the district. I think it's critically important based upon enrollments, based upon building capacities and conditions. Uh, one of the things that we learned from the uh, FMP process was that many of our buildings uh, are, are simply not full. And, uh, and that's inefficient and results uh, oftentimes in, in are spending more than necessary. But the discussion uh, on consolidation reminds me or, 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 or caused me to think about something else that I want to ask, um, especially with uh, just one more round of highlighting uh, Latin. And I know we have other courses throughout the district where we have relatively low enrollment, and that's certainly a factor in this, where if we take advantage of our size and we, um, you know, if we look throughout the district at uh, students who might be interested in studying Latin um, and consolidate for the purpose of certain courses or certain programs, uh, we might be able to uh, support, reasonably support those programs and justify having them. Uh, we may not have enough students in one building, but if we look broader, uh, we may have enough students uh, elsewhere. Uh, it will take some creativity, but I, I think that uh, you know, creativity is one of the very important things that we have to bring to this process. And uh, there, I, I'm certain, but don't know off the top of my head what other programs are similarly situated uh, but I have no doubt that there are many and that we can do some, some things uh, both to save some dollars and to protect some of the important programs. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Or that was a statement. That was a statement. Well, I, it, it's, it's a question, but I don't anticipate an immediate response or an answer today. But I, I hope you will get back to us uh, about what we can do along those lines as part of this budget process. Is it on page 13 or 14? Yes, yeah, it's on page 13, I'm ready. Yes. and I'm ready for 14, but on 13 and the consolidations, I just ask that you come back um, very clearly and ask us, I don't want to confuse the public of whether we are doing school closures or we're considering it now or we're looking at levy. It's a, it's a lot of considerations. This is on the list for 
to be considered. And I understand my colleague's advocacy, and I understand that because I'm a graduate of a building that's inequitable, that's high performing, that's in danger of losing Latin, IB, and it's raggedy as all get out and needs a new building. However, I just, I want to make sure we manage expect, and y'all are the bomb. I see y'all have, I see y'all, those are our CAI students right there. They're also in the Youth Council. And, and yet you still produce the highest level of achievement. So I just want to make sure we manage the expectations of the time frame in which we need to make critical decisions. We need to make a decision on the budget, and then we're going to start a process, what I hear you saying, to look at facilities, but that's not going to be done by March. So I, I, I would look forward to when you bring back uh, just a clear guidelines of the task we're going to undertake in relative to buildings and consolidations and enrollment. And we have a very clear path to look at and some anticipated timelines of, of when we're going to start and start and stop that work. Mr. Superintendent. President, Ms. Gibbs, uh, absolutely. One of the things that um, the administration looked at uh, in terms of looking at uh, consolidation of facilities and the reason why we identified it as something that we would consider but not recommend is because we were late in the process to consolidate buildings for this upcoming school year. Uh, typically, when we are, are faced with a, a, a review of our portfolio, that can be a four to six, sometimes eight month process depending on you know, how, um, uh, what our portfolio looks like. And so um, our recommendation, the reason we listed it in this document, was that we take most of 2018 to review our portfolio through a process that involved internal and external stakeholders so that we could have recommendations for the board to consider by the end of August, beginning of September, so that the board would have enough time to consider those options during the fall and then make a decision on those uh, options and recommendations you know, by uh, November or December so that we could go into the new lottery process in January of 2019 and then also have as a part of our budget considerations for the 1920 uh, school year those potential savings from that process. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Superintendent. Board Member Reyes. Uh, thank uh, Board Member. President Baker, uh, to the same extent that uh, Board Member Gibbs was um, stating, I think we need to also be very clear. There are some changes, cuts, of programmings, of, of curriculum, and so forth that are also being done within buildings that are not on this list. So I think there's a confusion in the public. There's some things that are being discussed today that uh, are not recommended to the board. They're not on this list to the board. Those are decisions as uh, we want to be clear. Principals at their buildings have the authority and the autonomy to make changes within their curriculum, their, their offerings, and so forth. Though I do appreciate, I just want to make sure that it's clear and there's not an assumption that this was a recommendation being brought to us through this process. Uh, though obviously it, it's important for us to hear about what's being um, what's concerning to our population out in the district but I uh, just as we're trying to be clear about consolidations of buildings I also want to make clear to the public that there are changes at, within school buildings that principals have the autonomy and discretion to do within their um, um, authority so just want to clarify that. All right, let's move on then to page 14, Mr. Superintendent, Madam Internal Auditor. Thank you, President Baker. Thank you, President Baker, Vice President Cope, members of the board. Um, the Office of Internal Audit is recommending that we reduce our uh, professional consulting for ACL from 15,000 down to 10,000 by reducing it by 5,000. We're also looking to, this really probably should be to eliminate um, our printing and binding budget of $25, seeing how we don't use that line item at much, if at all. Mr. Peretti? $25, that's really the line item? <laughs> okay. We don't 
we, we don't use printing and binding at much, if at all. I mean, for the most part, we might uh, use printing to print off our uh, risk analysis because it does have color. But for the most part, that just goes to the audit committee. That's all of around 15 copies. Um, so it's, it's not very expensive, and it's something that we could do without. Any other questions on page 14, colleagues? Thank you, Madam Internal Auditor. Mr. Superintendent. Uh, on page 15, the ninth office, uh, as a part of this review, is legal services represented by our chief uh, legal counsel, Larry Braverman. Uh, legal services reviewed an operational support and a proposed part-time FTE reduction. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add, Mr. Braverman? There's nothing really to add that that reduction would be a freeze across the entire five-year forecast. So it would, um, it's 56,128 in the first year. It would be over 200,000, I believe, um, all in throughout the five-year forecast. Are there any questions from board members? I, yeah. Mr. Brett. So uh, the personnel considered, not recommended. Could you briefly sort of explain, you know, what sort of impact that would have, even though it's still considered, who does that work right now and what sort of work it is? Um, President Baker, uh, Board Member Peretti, would be happy to talk about that uh, without attaching any names. Um, uh, the position is part of our effort to enforce in the district all of the anti-discrimination laws, both with respect to employees and with students. It's not only legally re required by law, but also required by a number of board policies and so in order to fulfill that function while we considered the position at the end of the day uh, it was our conclusion that it would it would uh, adversely affect our ability to uh, offer these services to our employees and our students i'm sorry thank you mr braverman any other questions on page 15 colleagues superintendent on page 16 this is the 10th office uh, as a part of our review, uh, which is the uh, superintendent's office. Uh, the superintendent's office is being represented this evening by Chief of Staff Maria Stockert. Uh, the superintendent's office identified an operational support budget item uh, and two proposed FTE reductions. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Chief of Staff Stock Stockert? Yes, thank you, Dr. Stanford. Um, in addition to what you see here, we're in the process of reviewing all administrative positions and um, identifying additional potential reductions for recommendation. Any questions on page 16? Thank you, Chief. Superintendent. Uh, on page 17, uh, last but not least, is our treasurer, uh, Stan Behork. Um, he's got a, a number of items that are identified and I'll turn it over to the treasurer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stanford. Um, what we've recommended out of uh, my office, um, first of all, I would say that I have a rather large budget, but the vast majority of that, probably over 90% of that, is related to dues and fees that we ha are legally required to pay, like auditor and treasurer's fees. So if you look at my budget overall, it's, it's large, but what is discretionary that we really can't control is rather small. But we went back and looked at all the non-personnel items, and these are the five uh, line items. So what we've done, um, to use the term that was used earlier this evening was to right size those. If you know, uh, those of you who have attended a finance and appropriations committee, um, we we know that some of the positive cash flow results we get is because we underspend our expenditure budgets. And we actually, in my presentation earlier about how we address the budget, have factored some of that favorable results into this for into this uh, process in terms of identifying how we might be able to address the deficit. What I've done here is on a micro scale, that is in my budget, to go back and look and say historically over the last uh, five years, how have we spent relative to what we've budgeted? And we've taken that portion out, which we typically don't expend. So that wiggle room, if you will, is what this is represented by. So we can reduce those budgets and not have any substantial impact on operations. So that was a fairly easy budget reduction to do. Um, there is a line item here uh, that was considered um, and but not recommended for reduction. It is actually tied to 
um, other programs, i.e., I. very specifically the athletic program. So in conjunction with considering any reduction in athletics, the board annually does a transfer to the athletic fund in support of that operation of about 700000 So since we were told everything's on the table, I included that as an option. So should you choose to do anything relative to athletics, I wanted you to know the cost of that transfer. But that certainly, because there isn't a reduction recommended there, that's not included on the recommended list. But we do do a transfer of $700,000 in support of that program. Um, additionally, uh, what I'm charged for uh, on a district-wide level is to fund various payroll-related charges, for instance, uh, health insurance, retirement, um, workers' compensation. And we do that through charging a, a, a fee, a rate, to all the payroll items and funds that, that have payroll in them. Um, we then manage that through what we call an agency fund um, uh, system. And so we, we make a charge through payroll, goes into the agency fund, and then we then pay out for workers' comp fees or retirement or whatever. So we have to look at those agency funds to make sure that we don't overfund them and don't underfund them, but just properly fund them. So that analysis for our workers' compensation uh, fund, uh, we've determined that we can reduce the rate that we charge all funds, and so all funds will benefit th from this, but specifically uh, by reducing that rate for the general fund, we can achieve this $2 million reduction. Um, it's not, it, it is a large number, but relative to our overall workers' comp uh, charge, it's, it's, um, it's a tweaking of that rate. We actually do this every year. We look at these rates as we charge them, so there are times when we might increase or reduce the rate. We don't talk about it because we, we just factor it into the budget process. But since we are in this reduction mode, um, it represented a significant number in this particular case over the four-year period that we're looking at, $8 million. I thought it was noteworthy. We would do this whether or not we are in this reduction mode. I just want you to know that. So that's part of what we do on a regular basis. But for this discussion, it does contribute to addressing that deficit in the long term. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Any questions on page 17? Mr. Preddy? Uh, real quick, um, Treasurer Borg, thank you. Um, I know we had talked and we had moved forward with some opportunity studies in the Treasurer's office some time ago. Is that reflective at all in any of these uh, line items and, you know, your office um, financially? Does it, is there any correlation whatsoever with that opportunity study? Um, Board Member Preddy. It's not some time ago because we're actively participating. It just started in January. Okay. So those results of that study won't be available it, though, until okay. um, probably six, eight months from now. Okay. So nothing has been reflected relative to that right. should there be some efficiencies developed from that study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vice President. He asked me a question. Any other questions on page 17, colleagues? All right. Sorry. On page 17? Nope. Okay. All right. Before we continue, I just want to um, let you all know that we did add a column. There was a question last meeting about is something going to be reduced or eliminated, and as you can see, that column has been added. So please do note that staff were responsive to your concerns about that. There's also another final page that has been added. It's a breakdown of uh, recommended and not recommended, but considered items by office, uh, and there's also a sortation of high to low. So that's the last page in your packet. Ms. Gibbs? Oh. I was asking Mr. Peretti. Okay. Now you, Mr. Peretti, you say you have another question. Yep. Okay. So on page it's seven. It's on a page that we've already. It is, but it's relevant, through. and I feel like I need to ask it. And so on page seven, when we were looking at, we, you know, we, you know, no one likes to go through this. But again, you know, I want us to think outside the box. The college and career readiness counselors. Have we had any of the universities approach us? OSU has plenty of money. Have any of the universities come to say anything to us as a district to help us out in these times of need? OSU, Franklin, Columbus State, any, any of these that have, these internship coordinators help with our kids? Have we had any of those conversations or thought of that? Or is that even a possibility? Just a thought of mine. I mean, you know, this is a community effort. We should all be in on this. Is that question clear, Mr. Superintendent? I, I was going to, uh, Mr. President, I was, uh, I, I think I'm clear on the question. Uh, so, Mr. President, Mr. Peretti, um, we 
have had some brief conversations with the university about our budget reduction process, uh, but those conversations did not get to that level of detail uh, that you're asking right now. And so we can definitely uh, go back uh, and, and have uh, some additional conversations uh, the, and, and to, uh, especially with the, the College of Education to see if there are any opportunities uh, throughout the, our, our entire budget yeah. uh, where, where they might be able to uh, assist us. We, we have had those type of, of conversations with other uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, that we have met with, and so it would be appropriate to have that same type of conversation with, with The Ohio State University as well. Okay, thank you for that question, Mr. Preddy, and that response. Yes, Ms. Gibbs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the entire team that took their time to um, give their input and deliberations uh, over this budget recommendation. I, there were a lot of comments made today, so I just want to ask clarifying questions so that we and the listening public are clear about what is and is not um, proposed in this document that we have now did one full review of. Number one, according to this document, we are not cutting athletics. Is that correct? That is correct. Oh, that is correct. Okay. Ms. Number Ms. two. Could clarify it, that the administration is not recommending that's what I said. that for, okay. I, that's, that's the what way I said. you phrased it, I just thought you said we are not doing that. No. Okay. My preamble said for the, I apologize. for the clarification for the viewing and listening public, I wanted to make sure people knew what was and what was not in this recommended budget. Okay. Okay. Thank so Thank at this clarify. time, yeah, that's okay. At this time, we're not recommending cutting athletics. Cur and I got a nod that said correct. Mr. Mr. President, uh, Ms. Gibbs, that is correct. Okay. Number two, there was a, a statement made earlier, but I want clarification. In our high schools, do every one of our high schools offer a foreign language? Do we have a high school that does not offer a foreign language option? Um, Mr. Uh, President, Ms. Gibbs, I'm going to turn to our chief academic officer to uh, try and answer your question. Not there may be one high school that does not offer a foreign language, and that would be uh, Columbus Iota. They're a specialized program. They are a specialized our, program. I, under that, but under our traditional schools, um, it's, someone may have been confused that these budget cuts would result in a school not having a foreign language, but that is not correct. Our traditional high schools will have at least one foreign language offering. That is correct, and I think just to clarify that the uh, foreign language um, that there have been a lot of discussion on, that is not a particular program that we are recommending to cut or has even been considered to cut. That is a site-based decision by a building administrator, and we're working through that process. Okay. So I, was, I wanted to make sure in the grand scheme of things, we were not reducing foreign language as a whole in, in these recommendations and that we're going to work through that in the IB program. Is IB in this, that is a recommendation in this budget to cut the IB program? The IB program has been considered. 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 It's considered, but it's not recommended at this time. That is correct. Okay. I just want, I wanted to make sure I, I understand where everything is. Okay. All right, Mr. Thank Price. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, Thank you. This is regarding to the TOSAs, our teachers on special assignment. You know, and like I said, these are our recommendations. We're still going through this process. But not only do I think of the value of the program, but all of us here also think of the individuals, you know, the people that these, you know, that rely on these jobs. With the TOSAs, through attrition, be relocated to the classroom. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Peretti, um, uh, as you well know, our teachers on special assignments are uh, teachers uh, who have uh, a lot of experience in the district. Uh, and so if there were a decision by the board to uh, staff reduce those positions, those individuals would have under the contract the right of uh, seniority rules applying to them as well. And so um, there might be opportunities for them to continue to be a part of the district by teaching in the classroom. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Board Member Gibbs? Just, just to share a concern that um, a, a former comment um, talked about eliminating field trips. And we know that there's a part of our budget that does this, but there's also a part of the title dollars. There's also resources available at the building level to pay for field trips, am I correct? I want clarification. And that there is another set of funds that principals can use to take field trips. We're just moving it from the, it's recommended to move it from this line item. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. President, Ms. Gibbs, that is correct. Um, our, um, our, our plan is, is to work with our principals at the building level to uh, utilize uh, their grant dollars and also the dollars from the general fund that they receive for their building operations to continue to provide those opportunities for our students. Okay, because one, one of the things I do not want to be perceived to come true is that this budget targets poor children. That statement bothered me, and that the idea that there are schools that can just write a check. My, and I understand we have some amazing PTAs, and they are remarkable, and they, and they fundraise. We have amazing PTAs across this district, um, but this budget still, ha we still are task to provide equitable opportunities for all students and so as we move forward in this process we want to make sure as we you know have six in one hand and half a dozen in the other that that in fact this budget does not unfairly disadvantage or remove access from schools that may not have those resources and that kids are not stuck all day listening to talk and chalk and they get to go to COSI and the historical society and get to have those enrichment activities. So I, I just put that in terms of uh, advancing your conversation about our public engagement process to say that that is something we'll, I'll be watching for. Uh, Mr. President, Ms. Gibbs, uh, and then I'll uh, turn to our, our chief academic officer because I believe she has some comments she'd like to make on this as well. Um, but as, as already um, memorialized in our district through our mission statement uh, and also through our uh, goals as an organization, uh, when we talk about each student, we are talking about the mantra that we've lived by for years, and that is all means all. Uh, and so we are driven by a, a, a value in this district to provide equity and equitable opportunities across our district. And so that is always at the forefront of our decision making uh, when it comes to making any decision in this district. And so uh, I'll turn over to uh, our chief academic officer to see if she wants to add anything else. Thank you. And thank you, board member Gibbs. That was a, um, the question that you brought up. Field experiences for our young people are a part of the school experience when you think about experiential learning. So our next step in this process is to work with building principals to see what those traditional field experiences are and how they are directly aligned with certain content. And then looking at their budgets that they have, whether it is their principals fund, which is general fund budget, and title dollars, ensuring that our young people will not miss out on experiences. Um, there was another concern brought up about Chromebooks, and I just want to put this out there. We have over 25,000 Chromebooks in the district. There is not one school that doesn't have Chromebooks in the districts. And I've been working with teaching and learning, and those schools that may only have three or four Chromebook carts this year, we're going to get them more Chromebook cards. So when you think about 25,000 Chromebooks and you think about our 51,000 students, we're about two to one ratio. So when, when it comes to technology, I don't want you to think that our young people don't have it or we're cutting it out or there is a school over there on the other side of the track that doesn't have the technology because all means all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peretti. I believe you were next. No, Mr. Mr. Brown? No, I'm fine. Okay. Very good. All right, well, if there are no other questions on the reductions, then Mr. Superintendent, you want to take us? Yes, Board Member Reyes. So, uh, thank you. You're Dr. Welcome. Stanford, uh, just um, an ask. 
Uh, there are a lot of questions that we've posed in the last uh, two sessions, and we've had some explanations of some of these funds will be transferred into uh, general fund dollars and be redistrib redistributed into the, into the district, like field trips and other expenses. Will we be able to see how or what is being allocated out of that to ensure that that is correct? It just seems like there's a lot of stuff coming out. We keep saying they're going to be paid out of general fund dollars or or different fund dollars, and I just is there a way that we can see that it's actually going to occur, or have you already outlined to say when your response is it's going to general fund dollars, then my assumption it's it's there and it's already been allocated. Uh, Mr. President, Ms. Reyes, um, I, I think um, it's a that's a very good question, uh, and we've been so focused on. Uh, this deficit and, and trying to meet, but we, we will still have a budget process to go through um, and, and to prepare you to, for the adoption of an appropriations resolution by the end of June. And uh, I, I think your question is one that we can certainly, as an administration, work towards uh, answering during the rest of the budget development process by the end of June so that once we know what the reductions are going to be, if it is still a question, we can then try and, and respond as best we can to show uh, you and the rest of your colleagues, you know, how uh, those uh, other items are being addressed with the available resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we've been through the recommended reductions, and now do you want to talk about public engagement, Mr. Superintendent? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, so. Uh, wanted to provide the, the public an opportunity to hear uh, what some of our, our thinking is as an administration and also to receive uh, the Board of Education's guidance on how um, you would like to see the public engagement uh, part of this process uh, to uh, look as we move forward. And so one of the, uh, the, what we would offer as an administration is that the Board consider uh, having four community forums across the city, one in each region. So one in, on the north side of town, one on the east side of town, west side, and on the south side of town. Um, and what we have two uh, options that we would like the board to consider. The first option would be to have one forum per night uh, during the week of February the 19th, uh, where uh, the board uh, would have, uh, again, in one part of the region on the 19th, then another part of the city another region of the city on the 20th, the 21st, and then the 22nd. The second option would be to have two forms on the 19th, one form on the 20th, and then one form on the 21st or the 22nd. Um, I, I definitely would like to uh, highlight uh, for the board that um, February the 20th is a board meeting uh, night, and so what we are, are are recommending is that we would try our best to keep the agenda that evening very light so that we could spend the, the majority of the time uh, receiving public comment uh, from the public and having you know this public engagement process as a part of your regular uh, board meeting, uh, if you will, killing two birds with one stone. Um, the, the other um, uh, thing that we, the other item that we would like to bring to the board's attention is that on the 21st and 22nd, uh, those are also the evenings that the mayor has identified as a part of the mayor's uh, state of the city process that he has engaged in um, over the, the last uh, a few weeks. And so as a part of that process, I believe the mayor's forums are from uh, 7.30 until uh, 7, 7 o'clock. And so, um, we would, uh, we would offer that uh, our public engagement process could start maybe at 730 and then go until about maybe 930 in the evening so that, that if board members wanted to attend and also community members wanted to attend both events, they would be able to, to do so. Um, we, and so when we look at the logistics for uh, our, the, the forms that we are proposing, uh, we certainly are proposing that these uh, forms take place at school school sites uh, across the district, that we videotape the forum so that they could be um, 
uh, broadcast uh, live through the, the, uh, the normal vehicle that we use to broadcast the, media, uh, the uh, meetings, but also that the videotape is also a record of the meetings. Uh, the, the treasurer and myself would start those forums out with a brief presentation, and, and then we would uh, offer the rest of the time for engagement with, with the community. Uh, again, except for those uh, evenings where uh, there may be a potential uh, conflict with the mayor's uh, community forums, uh, we would suggest that these uh, forums start at 5.30, uh, and then the board decide uh, how long they would like the forums to go, whether they be two hours or three hours uh, in length, and that uh, we not only use these uh, forums as an opportunity to hear uh, the concerns of the community, but we also use it as an opportunity to receive suggestions and ideas from the community. Uh, in the, the couple of board meetings that we've had where members of the community have, have uh, presented uh, to the board, uh, they not only have identified concerns, but they have also identified ideas uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the administration should explore as well. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. And I know that the personnel recommendations that you expect to make to us on March 16th are driving the expediency with which we need to engage the community. And so, what did I say? Oh, I meant March 6th, I apologize. So I, I know that uh, time is short, and so I know these recommendations aren't ideal because we need enough time to give people notice, but we also need enough time for staff then to react uh, prior to making those recommendations, which we have to see on the 6th based upon discussions we've had with, uh, with labor. So not ideal, but we appreciate your recommendations. And is there input? I believe Ms. Gibbs was first. I'm not even gonna start with my birthday. I'm just gonna offer, um, if we are gonna hold forums, um, and you're saying two forums, I think it's very important that we are able to be at both of them. So it, um, so I see, I like option one, but the 19th is a holiday, it's President's Day, and many people are already scheduled to be out of town. So mm -hmm. would it be possible to add a 15th, a February 15th, um, and you can come back and tell us, and then pick up with 2021 and maybe 22 after that. But the 20th, I don't know, if, are schools closed that day? Or are y'all going? The 19th, February. February 19th, the schools are closed. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna ask that we honor our staff and everyone and let them have that day off. But the 15th though, if we could put the 15th on there, we could do the fourth. It's, we've already got something scheduled for the 15th. In the evening? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We already have board activity that night. Oh, we do. Yeah. yeah. We did, so. So the 19th and the 20th, 21st. <laughs> we did. And the I just want to offer, 530 is tough for parents to get to. So 6 o'clock, I think, is I can get home, get my kids, get them fed, and then come back to a meeting, especially if we're not providing refreshments. So I, I would just offer, we make it a more convenient time for people to get there. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Mr. Brown? Uh, a few similar thoughts, but uh, uh, with respect to the two nights the mayor has his events from 6 to 7.30, one of those is at Kang Arts and one of those is at Linden, um, what I would suggest that we consider is uh, simply not pushing them back to 7.30, because that's late to get started with this, but to go ahead and do them at 5.30, but do them on opposite parts of town. Uh, most people are gonna wanna get to one of these based on what's closest. And uh, we can, you know, since we're gonna be doing four of them, uh, you know, we can do it on opposite parts of, of town and at, at a better time. Uh, secondly, with respect to uh, the Monday President's Day, uh, I think it does make sense to do that. And especially if we're going to do two that day, um, it's an opportunity that we might be able to do one earlier in the afternoon. 
and be able to catch some people um, who can attend at that time, in part because it's President's Day and they might be off work um, if they're state or, or government employees, uh, county employees, that we might not otherwise get to uh, one of the other forms. Mr. Freddie. So, you know, I'm really, you know, we, it's always good to get out into the community and to hear the community, but a lot of the time it's, you know, us listening to the community. Um, you know, the general public. And I'm, and I'm sure we have met with uh, a lot of different groups, but I would also suggest that we have some work groups, maybe a work group of CEA, OPSI, they can come in and talk at some other time to go over, hey, look, this is some of the issues we may have with this, you know, talk through some of these uh, different recommendations and considerations uh, and have focus groups maybe for, for a couple of different populations of people so that we're getting focused insight and, and uh, feedback because um, a lot of the times you know you get information from one person or another you know I frankly I'd like to get everyone in the same room together and discuss these things so that everyone's on the same page and I'm sure you have done that already but I just want to make sure. Superintendent. Um, Mr. President, Mr. Peretti, I just want to uh, get some clarity from um, your, your suggestion. Um, are, are you suggesting that these work groups would be attended by the board as um, as a part of? I mean, we could what? sure. I mean, we could be there, but I think it would be good to have. And we're talking about all these different personnel uh, uh, decisions that could come down the line. I would, you know, I would like to make sure that you know there's a time when, you know, like again, the board can attend these public forums, but that we have specific work groups for specific populations of people like CEA and OPSI since this affects them. And if there are, you know, questions or anything like that, that it gives us a, you know, gives you in the district a, a platform to discuss this. Uh, Mr. President, um, Mr. Perret, I, again, I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear on what you're suggesting. Just a date where you tell CEA to come to the building and we talk about budget recommendations. Something like that, you know what I mean? CEA, OPC. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with with things. Oh, I see all my colleagues scrunching their faces. I mean, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that you know when we're talking about these sort of recommendations, I want to make sure that you know there's an opportunity for everyone. I mean, public forums are nice, but you get you know what you get from the public, you know. So I want to make sure that we have specific conversations with people, and if, you know, if that's confusing or a bad idea, I apologize. I just want to make sure that everyone has come to the table and has discussed these budget recommendations and if there are any issues with them or other strategies that there is some sort of platform that it's being discussed at. Thank you, Mr. Peretti. I do know that the administration has already begun to engage some of those other groups and has had specific meetings with them and has briefed other elected officials and so on. So I know that the administration is already doing its homework on that uh, in that area and will continue to do so. And that's that's critically important. So it's not a bad suggestion, but already in the works. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Peretti. Uh, now, Board Member Hudson. President Baker, and my apologies for my tardiness. Um, thank you for, I have been following what, what's been going on, so. Um, we already went through the budget. Pardon me? We already went through all these. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to step back a little bit on the 15th, the FAC meeting. So here's the, the issue I have is, uh, we, so we have these cuts, and this presentation is good. We have yet, we haven't really seen the full budget yet. We've just seen what's not in the budget. And so I think we've got to see what's in it. So we have like the full picture, so we're not just looking at the whole. Um, and yes. So Mr. President, um, Ms. Hudson, if, if I'm following you, uh, one of the things that we have done as an administrative staff is that we, um, we, took the budget document, narrative document, that you as a board worked through in the adoption of the appropriation for fiscal year 18, mm -hmm. and we have amended that document to also include the budget reductions. So that way, uh, you as a board and the community as a whole would be able to see what we appropriated as a part of the fiscal year 18 budget and see how that impacts, how the budget reductions we are speaking of would impact those budget items. 
And so you can see it in one document um, because there, it's done by OPU operating unit so that uh, you would be able to see how those uh, operating units are impacted by the reductions that we are speaking of. And we'd be more than happy to share that document at the FAC community, I'm sorry, committee, so that uh, we can get the feedback from the committee as a part of what those impacts might look like. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, thank you. I, and then we could get FAC's feedback on presentation, on manner of putting that forward, and, and so then it's a decision-making tool and a comment tool. Um, but I, I think it's important we have a comprehensive view of what we are, what we're doing, because there's a lot that we're doing, and um, and then um, it allows the board to provide feedback on options for what choice, bad choices we have to make. Not bad, difficult choices we have to make. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, just a quick question. I, I I think that we have a model that we've utilized in years previous for public engagement on these decision-making matters. Uh, one of those models we utilized was for our listening tour. We offered the opportunity for folks in the community to come to a specific site and then hear a kind of, or have a kind of preamble discussion, if you will, a preliminary kind of idea of what the course of the evening is going to be. And from that point forward, then break out into groups, or excuse me, into uh, work groups, if you will, that offer different areas of interest, whether it was categorized as academic operations, what have you, um, facilities, uh, and then have those respective conversations in those work groups. Um, I think that's a, a good way uh, that worked for us previous, and I think a good way that could work for us moving forward. Um, so that the my my scrunch face, if at all, was really. Yeah, you weren't scratching your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My scrunch face, if at all, was just just processing that opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Just a just a question, and and to thank you for speaking to past process, because I really would like to um, ask two things. Number one, how are we going to get student input in this process? How are we going to reach kids, middle and high school? I mean, elementary as well, but I'm sure they're represented by their parents, but what is our student input plan? Uh, Mr. President, um, Ms. Gibbs, um, so students is a very important uh, stakeholder group that we have not reached out to yet. And my recommendation would be to allow the administration uh, to hold focus group meetings uh, with middle school and high school students over the, the next uh, few weeks to, to get that valuable input as well. Um, the next one is when we hold, often when we hold these community engagement processes, no matter if it's around facilities or school closures or the budget, it becomes, um, there are people who show up and then we historically have communities that are underrepresented. They don't come out. How will we make sure those communities, those sides of town, those traditionally underrepresented communities, families, and groups in the advocacy realm, how will we get their voice? How will we get the new American voice? How will we get some of the other voices that somehow we don't seem to get. There are people who we know are going to be there, but I don't want it to be whoever shows up the most, the loudest, the squeakiest wheel does not always get the oil. Sure. The wheel that needs it is going to get the oil. And so how are we going to make sure we're looking at everyone fairly and how are we going to take that extra measure to get those communities, and we know it because we've done this for 100, 100 years, how are we going to try to get them this time to give us some in, input on uh, the budget. Uh, Mr. President, Ms. Gibbs, uh, again, another very good question. And one of the things that we have thought about uh, in that regard is to uh, work with our, our neighborhood associations and then also to work with the uh, city's uh, neighborhood office uh, to uh, help us with that outreach uh, to those uh, groups and, and those individuals that may not necessarily you know, be a part of the normal 
uh, processes that we, we have had in the past. And um, when we uh, worked with the innovative high school um, process, uh, working with the, um, the neighborhood office, uh, Carla William Scott was very helpful in identifying other individuals in the community that we could reach out to to try and get them involved in the process. And so I would recommend that we do the same thing, working with the city, also working with the county to try and, and reach out to those other constituents and, and try and encourage them to be a part of the process as well. I'm going to, um, I would ask the administration to come back with some recommendations because this, we have a very tight time frame. So the idea that you're going to get to a lot of people in this short time frame is difficult, but we have an entire year of what we discussed about business planning and consolidations. We're going to need to do this process many different times. So um, in that, I, I would just offer students with disabilities, they need, a, they need an individual dedicated outreach and voice, and not just two or three families that are always there. We need to really understand how is this going to affect students with disabilities, how is this going to affect those um, our transitioning students, how does it affect homeless students, how does it affect <laughs> students that are in our, our systems, um, and how is it going to um, affect our gifted students? Really, how, we, we often leave them out of what, what this will do and their overall impact and their learning, but them and our new Americans, a new American doesn't necessarily always translate to ESL. So there are people who come to this country that can speak English just fine, and then there are English language learners. They make up a significant part and sometimes are lost if we are not close to them in these buildings. So I will offer, if you'll just come back with a recommendation, not just for now, but ways and new ways that we're going to make sure they're involved in these type of processes so we know that we are getting their voice and, and, and not just getting their voice, but they also understand what we are doing so they have the information as well. And it's, it can be daunting getting phone dollar after phone dollar after newsletter. And if you got multiple kids in multiple schools, it stacks up well. But this is very important. So I'll just offer that I think you can give us guidance on ensuring you can tell us how that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. I might also suggest that when we are choosing the locations for the forum, we be intentional in that, and maybe that's a way we can get into some of those communities that may not come out on a regular basis. Uh, Board Member Hudson. Thank you, President Baker. I'm exhausted hearing that. I, I think we got to look at the time frame, certainly. We've, this is a very narrow time frame. It sounds like the administration has a pretty thorough plan already, and I think President Baker is wise as we consider all that. I'd like, we, I know um, we want to wrap our arms around everyone, but I think we've got to be um, uh, mindful of the time. I was wondering if, um, and, and certainly, well, listening to her was a great model. Again, I, it's also pretty staff intensive, and had, we had a lot of outside help for that. I'm wondering if we could, um, you know, we move forward with the administration's plan, if possibly also we could have um, a survey or a way to do comments through our our, um, our app, our website. We could have that translated into several different, you know, one survey translated into several languages. Um, the community, it would be simple, but that folks could, um, then students and others could reply through that and um, tally the results. So we, as a board, could see that an aggregate and get, you know, sort of that more immediate feedback. Um, and, and kind of being mindful of the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that, uh, MJ, because um, I actually totally agree with it. Um, I think that reaching that younger student group using our app, um, uh, providing that opportunity for them to interact with us that way is an outstanding opportunity. Uh, we integrated in the listening tour model um, a IT component that was very much survey based, if you all recall. We did not only capture audience, we captured about 500 people. We captured a significant number of those <laughs> folks online. Um, what I would also like to recommend is maybe you guys take a look at Teletown Halls. Um, I had the opportunity to execute these types of things in other school districts, Pickerington, namely. Um, 
So there's some opportunities there that we can capture these kinds of audiences uh, without having folks even leaving the comfort of their homes. So if we can look at a very integrated model uh, that allows for telephone use, that allows for some act IT activity, uh, that doesn't take people out of their space, allows them uh, to have direct access to us. We do utilize Facebook Live um, as another model. Um, here's an opportunity for us to continue that dialogue and get the kind of feedback that we're looking for. Thank you. All right. So. I, I know the administration wants input on this. I know they appreciate all the input, and I know there are a couple more comments, uh, but we, speaking of being respectful of time, we do certainly want to respect people's time. So I know we have two or three more comments, and then let's try to bring this part of the meeting to a close. Uh, I believe it was Ms. Gibbs and then I just, Ms. Brown. I, and I understand, and, and I want to make sure I heard your comment um, correctly, Board Member Hudson. I, I'm not sure what you said about it being exhausting, but I will say we can't be too busy to serve our kids. So if there's anybody who's more important to hear from, it's the people who all this paper is about. All this paper isn't about a business community, isn't about, you know, uh, in any one person. It's about those 51,000 students who have to live with the decisions of what we're going to do, and then the staff that have to carry that out. So we know we already know this so we know it's a tight time frame but we know every time we get ready to have a community engagement it's a tight time frame so let's get better models to be able to work better in tight time frames that's my piece and so i i know we can't do it all but what i will say is i i just don't see moving forward without a significant student voice and then those communities in whatever way you know we can get them I'm, I'm just going to reiterate the point that that if we're going to do that outreach even if it is to say what is the best building to hold this meeting for you what you know which one do you think would be great app call tell up however you get it done i just think that is very important and i want to mm -hmm. thank you mr brown uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Baker. Um, let me just offer uh, a couple of thoughts that are a little bit different. Um, I think that uh, to some extent I might have heard this uh, uh, in Mary Jo's comments, but uh, we've got a very short time frame. We've got a lot to do, and ultimately this is uh, decisions that are going to be uh, recommended by the administration and decided by the seven of us as board members. Uh, the input we get uh, is certainly helpful and it's very helpful to have a transparent process and a place where people have the opportunity to comment. But we're not gonna hear from the overwhelming majority of people. At most, we may hear from 1% of the community, perhaps not even that. We need, we, we, we again, um, uh, need to keep in mind that 85% or more of the people that we serve as residents, as taxpayers, as part of the community are not engaged with the schools. And yet their views are also important. And part of our job as school board members is to represent them and make the best decisions we can with the information we have. So an exhaustive process um, that spends a lot of time just trying to gather that input, um, I don't think is where we need to spend our energy and our time. Yes, we want to give everybody the opportunity, but you know, we're still, even if we do that, we're going to hear from a very small part and, uh, and it's some quality thinking and discussion by our administration, our, our professionals uh, that you have with various constituencies that you deal with, and we're going to hear from some, and then we just need to get at it. And, uh, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, you know, I don't think that any of us is ne are necessarily going to attend every one of those public forums or other meetings. Um, hopefully somebody is there taking notes for us and taking the ideas that result from those discussions 
and, uh, and, and able to present that to us. But uh, please, let's you know, make sure we keep the process reasonable and not overdo uh, that portion of this work. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Board Member Reyes. So um, the only thing I would add is I think today was a good indication that there are some, some information and some questions that are out there from the general public uh, of things that are being cut, not being cut, are recommended, um, especially some of the bigger items such as, uh, as outlined by uh, Board Member Gibbs earlier. Just want to throw this out there is if there's a possibility of making some sort of FAQ. Uh, I know that sometimes when you make a response and you say, no, that's not going to be cut, and then it comes around and it, it gets back on the table, I think there's always that possibility. But uh, doing this before with school closer, closures and budget cuts, what happens is um, not everybody's voice is heard because we spend a lot of time on things that um, either we don't respond and say, hey, that's not being done or that's not occurring, so that the 20 people that are going to talk about that, top, that topic would say, oh, wait a minute, that's not being done, okay, let's back out. So like today, we've received a lot of emails of some miscommunication that was put out there about our particular school. Um, so I don't know how we could <coughs> possibly at least be able to provide a FAQ that this spells, perhaps we get, I'm just throwing this out, 30 of the same question saying uh, we're going to get rid of the, you know, the footsteps to XY building. And if that's not true, then there's an opportunity for us to maybe address that so they can feel comfortable and at ease. And then perhaps we can really address um, the first 300. Uh, people that have questions about significant items that are on the table. Thank you, Board Member Reyes. All right, Mr. Superintendent, do you think you have enough feedback on that item to move forward with your planning? Oh, I beg your pardon, Board Member Hudson. I just want to clarify that with feedback, there's also consensus. Like, what the consensus? Um, Ms. Gibbs, respectfully, I am not. I was not saying no one's important. And I was not saying it's only certain constituencies that are important. I was merely saying we need to be efficient because we only have 28 days. And we only have the staff is also, our administrative team can only do so much in one day. And so I want to be mindful of that and try to be efficient. Um, so with that in mind, that please, I, that, that's um, certainly what I was saying. And, um, but also, there were a number of items you asked for the superintendent to get back to us on, and we don't have time to get back. I think. We're sort of, this is it. So that's all. I just, I guess I, um, uh, the get back to us is now, I think, so we can get consensus because we don't meet again. Um, no. and otherwise, it's get back to one of us, which isn't consensus. And I, I think we need to have a, a general understanding of what the process is by the time we're done tonight. Excuse me. Um, so we are talking about clarification around public public engagement. Yes. Okay. Yes. So back to my question: Do you feel like you have enough feedback from the board uh, to move forward on the public engagement option one versus option two, the superintendent? Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I believe I do. I, I thought I heard uh, from the board uh, that uh, you would like to pursue option one, which was one form per night. Um, and that um, when it came to the potential conflicts with the city, uh, I, I think I heard uh, a consensus, uh, and even from the director, that uh, you know having our uh, forms at the normal time of 5.30, 6 o'clock would be okay as long as we went to another side of town as opposed to uh, being on the, side of, the same side of town that the, the uh, mayor's form is on as well, um, and that we would, um, we would continue our work going back to Mr. Peretti's uh, feedback and even Mrs. Gibbs' feedback to a certain degree. We would continue to reach out to uh, various uh, stakeholder groups that we've already engaged in and continue to identify uh, stakeholder groups uh, that we as an administration would meet with and not try to 
uh, coordinate, co coordinate that with board member schedules, but of course would make the board aware of when those meetings would occur so that if board members did have an open uh, uh, period of time on their calendars that they would be uh, welcome to attend those sessions as well. So that's kind of what I've, I've heard uh, over these last uh, few moments of, of conversation. Uh, also, um, looking at um, the, um, the agenda and the format for those forms, that's something that you know, we can, as an administration, put together and share with the board uh, in an email uh, to get you know, feedback from the board that way as well in, in developing the agenda. Okay, very good. And I think it's important to keep in mind that these community forums are not to hear from us, the board, they're to hear from the community. And obviously, I know I'll try to attend them all if, it's, if that's possible, with the possible exception of the 20th when we'll be here in a board meeting. But I think it's really important that we do hear from the community, continue to hear from them on these proposed budget reductions. If they're, yes, board, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President. I would really recommend, again, because of the arguments made at the table about time consideration and audience consideration, <coughs> it's really important that we approach this with an integrated model that allows us to be efficient and effective. And that is by telephone, that is by application, electronically. Let's look at how we integrate these, these processes here and make sure that there's alignment of resource access. And what I mean by that is this. If we are bringing certain documents to this, to our public forums like this, that this is also available online for folks to be able to scroll through. And if they had a line item question the way that we have or line item feedback the way that we have, they can make that, if that makes sense. But I think it's important to not just do this physical piece, but to do something that integrates and takes in consideration very seriously people staying in the comfort of their homes and still having that access to us. Phone, internet. Yes, um, and I, I couldn't agree more. And at our meeting last Tuesday, as you may recall, everyone who attended was provided with five different opportunities by which they could reach out to us on this, whether it was a, sp a special email we set up or through the app or through the website or by calling or, you know, God forbid, by sending us an actual piece of mail through the mail. So there are lots of ways that people can participate. I think it's incredibly important that we provide those opportunities and make sure everyone knows that they do exist because it works better for, for some people. Board Member Hudson? Uh, I'll just reiterate though, I think just sent, having this alone is not helpful. It's helpful for us in the context, but we, because we're more familiar with the budget, I think for the community, they've got to see what's around each of these things. So, you know, where it says eliminate certain teachers, we need to see who else is around, who's there to eliminate substitutes. So if I was a, I was a parent, I would think, well, what if my teacher, kid's teacher's sick? Who's gonna be there? Like having some context around that. Um, and that's where I think this is a tool for a decision making tool or it's a tool here, but I don't know that I think we've got a we've got to translate. That's why I was asking about material to FAC and then put it out. Mr. Oh. Treasurer. Just just because the budget director and I are responsible for baking the rows, the columns and the columns of the rows and crunching the data. Um, this seemed to work for one purpose, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Mr. Gooding has already worked, I think it's about 150 pages of our budget document that shows what you saw when we went through the FY18, the current fiscal year budget preparation process with the ad addition on each operational unit of how these reductions fit in. I guess we're gonna, I'm sure share that. I would probably share that with you sooner rather than later. I wouldn't wait to FAC because if you have feedback and 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 I, I say it somewhat humorously, but this is the if you want the rows, the columns, and the columns of rows, we can do that, but we need to know it ASAP. So I think it's important that you see that 150-page document. It's all it's ready. I was just looking at it. Um, so then you would have it before FAC, and if there's a different compilation that explains it in a way that you think is better, then we, we, would, we would know that. Um, so I, I think we've got something that we want to share with you quickly. 
But it's unfortunate that you know we don't. It's released without getting the feedback from FAC, which is exactly what they're, what it's for. Yeah. You, right. you mean you want that? You want us to take that document to FAC before we share it with you? Well, no. I maybe share it with. I. I, I just. Um, oh, they did get it. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm. I, I've been gone for a bit. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So. So FAC will see that and talk about that again prior to these uh, community forums. So I think that will help to provide perspective that the people need. Ms. Gibbs. So that I, help me understand then what does that mean for, since we're getting consensus, then what does that mean for what we take to the community? After FAC sees it and you take it through the deep dive, then what does that mean for what we take out to the community? Are you suggesting that we take something more expansive out to the community or something more condensed, condensed to the community? I think the point of FAC Mr. is to give us, thank you, is to give us sort of another perspective, another way of looking at it with their expertise. Now, I'm thinking of a narrative and an executive summary. It's okay. sort of what I have in my mind that helps explain it to the public. They could help us sort of think about things that we're not thinking necessarily because we're just in this silo right here. That's the nice thing about that, but a narrative and then some sort of executive summary that goes over it that explains the red book analysis. I keep on referring to the state house budget, but that's sort of what I'm thinking. Okay. All right. Very good. Any other questions on public engagement? Thank you for that thorough discussion and thank you for your patience, everyone. All right. Very good. Let's then. Uh, let's see if there's anything else from the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. President. There is just one more item. I just wanted to remind the Board of <laughs> Education that this week is Relationship Week. And this is a part of our effort to promote the uh, culture and climate uh, strategies and efforts of the district, especially from our incredible student and family engagement team that has worked very, very hard. Uh, on um, our second annual Re Relationship Week celebration. You may have noticed when you walked into the boardroom, the assembly room, right outside of the assembly room, uh, we have placed uh, hello in 25 different language. And you're probably uh, asking why hello. Well, hello is the theme for this year's uh, Relationship Week celebration. And we are reminding people that great things start when you just take a moment to say hello uh, to your neighbor or to those that are around you. It, be, it breaks barriers and it sparks relationships that can last a lifetime. And so um, one of the things also that we're highlighting this week is that tomorrow morning uh, we will start with hello, uh, our, our hello celebration um, organized by the Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, which is a national nonprofit based uh, out of Newton, Newtown, uh, Connecticut. And if you may recall uh, that this organization uh, arose out of the Sandy Hook uh, ele Elementary School um, um, incident uh, where unfortunately a lot of young people uh, lost their lives. And so uh, they'll be at uh, Champion Middle School tomorrow. Uh, and Mark Barden, who is the father of seven-year-old Daniel Barden, who was one of those young people that lost their lives uh, in 2012, along with 19 other uh, first grade classmates. And so he will be here tomorrow at uh, Champion uh, Middle School. So thank you. Um, and I don't have that with me. I'm going to turn to um, our communications director to, to tell us the time of the event at uh, Champion Middle School. That event begins at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude your report, Mr. Superintendent? Yes, it does, Mr. President. Thank you All right. very much. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Let's move on to hear from our internal auditor, Madam Internal Auditor. Thank you, President Baker, uh, Vice President Cole, members of the board. I am. I regret having to uh, try to get one more meeting in February, but um, the Audit and Accountability Committee um, at some point, hopefully this month, we'll need to schedule a meeting because the Auditor of State has met with the administration. We've gone over some preliminary um, issues they brought to our attention, and they are ready to have a meeting with the Audit and Accountability Committee. And as a courtesy, we also invite any board members who want to attend 
So I will definitely keep in mind to stay away from the dates that are before me. And um, hopefully we can get something scheduled that following week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that conclude your report? Yes, it does. Thank you. Mr. Treasurer. Uh, thank you, President Baker. Thursday the 15th, FAC meets 4.30 here. That concludes my report. Oh, outstanding. All right. Thank you very much. Hope your arm is healing as quickly as possible. And uh, now the board will take up its consent agenda. Is there a motion that it be approved as presented? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All right. Are there any questions or comments related to any piece of legislation contained within the consent agenda this evening? Almost. Mr. Peretti? Almost. Just thank you for the donations to Coleraine, Centennial, and uh, cash and materials donation from the Invention League. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to those uh, who gave those donations to the district. All right. Mr. Treasurer? Mr. Brown? Yes. Vice President Cole? Yes. Ms. Gibbs? Absent. Oh. Ms. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Pretty? Yes. Ms. Reyes? Yes. President Baker? Yes. That motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Let's move on then to announcements. And Mr. Brown. Just very briefly, um, last Thursday I had the opportunity to uh, stop by at COSI where uh, the color of science was the topic and this was an opportunity for many of our seventh grade students to uh, get to COSI to hear from Mayor Ginther, to uh, uh, get another perspective on Black History Month, and to uh, have some opportunities to think about science. Uh, it was, uh, I think we had six middle schools there, and, uh, and it was a really uh, great event for our students. So. I uh, just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much, and thank you to the city for our ongoing partnership with them, and I think that's a good segue into calling on Director Johnson to talk about the state of the city partnership. President Baker, members of the board, thank you for, so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this evening about the uh, neighborhood conversations that Mayor Ginther is holding instead of one big state of the city address. He's holding five uh, conversations throughout the community. One was held last Wednesday, January 31st at the Reeves Center. And uh, on February 13th, uh, one is being held at um, Jay Ashburn Center. The topic is going to be um, uh, celebrate one public health and the opioid addiction. That one is already sold out. Uh, so uh, there really isn't any capacity for that particular one, but I do want you to know that you can, it will be live streamed and so you can watch this on CTV. Um, the one you're probably more interested in and, and our, our community is very interested in is the one that will be held on February the 21st at the London Recreation Center located at 1254 Briarwood Avenue. The topic for the evening will be recreation and parks and pre-K education. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, the principal uh, from London Park Neighborhood Early Childhood Education Center, Candace Nespeka, would be a member of a panel of six to talk about um, pre-K and um, recreation and parks. So the format will be, um, you know, there will be re light refreshments at 530. Uh, the mayor will um, give a speech, a brief speech at beginning at six o'clock and then he will moderate the panel and there will be an opportunity for uh, community members to then ask questions. And uh, uh, President Baker, thank you for being at the one at the Reeves Center. Um, and then the, there will be an event February the 22nd at the King Arts Complex. Um, same time, the topic is diversity and inclusion and the Columbus Women's Commission. And then the last one will be March 6th at Milo Grogan Recreation Center, and the topic will be shared prosperity and mobility. So you do have to RSVP if you do want to attend those events. So all you need to do is to go to the City of Columbus website, that's columbus.gov, and uh, RSVP for uh, the February 21st, the 22nd, or the March 6th events. Very good, thank you, Director Johnson. 
And I should say that our own Dr. Keisha Hunley Jenkins was a member of the panel on the 13th, or excuse me, last, last Wednesday. And uh, we appreciate the partnership very much. Um, any other announcements? Ms. Gibbs. Um, very quickly, oh, and I'm an acknowledge you, but um, Director Johnson, those sessions are Facebook Live, aren't they? I watched it on Facebook, so. You know, you have to talk to someone who knows a lot more about technology than I. Uh, so I, they, they are live stream and Facebook Live. You can, yes, you can view it that way. Uh, and, and if you are not able to get into the main event, there is overflow space uh, at, at, on site there. So, and, and I'm sure you're, you will be able to uh, watch them. They'll all be recorded. And then you can watch them at your leisure in the uh, comfort of your own. Uh, home. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yes, so one more question and then I'm going to go to Ms. Gillison. Are our community forums, will they be recorded as well so that the community can see us live and streamed and all that? Great. Cause I, that was a very good model for me to watch. Um, and they did put it on Facebook and it was Columbus.gov. I think that live streamed it. So thank you very much. And Ms. Gillison. Yes, thank you. Hello. Hello. Relative to the question about foreign language and being respectful of what we're offering in our high schools, Columbus Sciota does offer Spanish. It is Columbus Downtown High School that does not offer the foreign language. So I didn't want this evening to close without sharing that information and making that correction. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right, if there's nothing else for the good of the order at this time, I'll ask the Vice President to offer a motion. That's why I wanted you to hand it to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education recess into executive session per section 121 per point two two G1 Ohio Revised Code to consider the employment or compensation of public employees or officials uh, and section 121.22 G3 Ohio Revised Code to confer with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. Second. Mr. Treasurer. Ms. Gibbs. Yes. Ms. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Peretti. Yes. Ms. Reyes. Yes. President Baker. Yes. Mr. Brown. Vice President Cole. We, yes. That motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. The board. Oh, Mr. Superintendent, I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, board members, but um, Dr. Klein just re reminded me that we have our elementary school fair tomorrow night. Uh, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Columbus Afrocentric, and we will have storybook characters there and also a very famous Buckeye from The Ohio State University called Brutus the Buckeye will be there as well. So wanted to thank our, our team for doing a great job of organizing the fairs. Snow day. Thank you. Are we, Mr. Superintendent, let me ask you one more thing. Are we anticipating potential snow day tomorrow. Should we be flushing ice cubes down the toilet? Uh, Mr. President, we are monitoring the weather and have been monitoring the weather all day and we will follow our normal procedure and protocols to make those decisions. Thank you. All right, so the board will now recess into executive session. We'll adjourn from those chambers without returning to these. Have a good evening.